Welcome to the first episode of my whiteboard series. So we're going to talk about Merkle trees, why Merkle trees, but also why a whiteboard series. I learned a lot from Nier's whiteboard series, and I even commented two years ago on how much I love it. And I was just thinking about how much I learned from whiteboard series and how I should start one. So I have a main channel with some really high quality videos. These videos are really great and they're high quality, but it's not worth it for me to make a full feature length episode around Merkle tree. So the whiteboard series is for the more funner, lower quality, more technical topics. And we're going to start with Merkle trees. So what are Merkle trees? When you think about Merkle trees, think about them as verifiability. So let's say these blocks are our data and we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. So let's just say I care about transaction D. This is my transaction. Without Merkle trees, I could ask the blockchain, hey, I want to know about transaction D. And the blockchain can give me a copy of transaction D, but how do I know if it's actually included? Like, I know this is my data, but is it in the blockchain? And so the only way to really know if your data is in the blockchain is to zoom out. So here's the blockchain. Go to the first block, download all that data, and then download all the transaction data all the way until you get to your transaction to know if it's included. You can imagine that this is not ideal to download all the data. So Merkle trees are able to generate Merkle proofs which can prove, hey, your transaction has been included in the blockchain. The reason why they call it Merkle trees is through its structure. And the structure has a Merkle root at the top. It has these little leaves at the bottom. The hashes of these leaves get combined into pairs until they hit the root. And then the root of one Merkle tree gets combined into the next Merkle tree. In order to understand the structure of Merkle trees, we first have to learn about hashes. So a hash function gets in any arbitrary size data, and then it outputs it as a fixed string size. And the most famous hash function is the SHA-256, which fixed output size is 62 characters. So we get in arbitrary data this can be any data of any size. We input it into the hash function and then it gives us a unique deterministic ID. So if we put the same arbitrary data, we'll get the same 64 character ID. And this ID is irreversible. So you cannot get an ID, try to reverse it, and then try to get back your old arbitrary data. This is a one way. So here's a calculator for the SHA-256 hash function. We just put in any data, this is the number one, and we're gonna calculate it, and here is the hash function. You can see if we put in two, it's a completely different hash. Remember that this data can be arbitrary and any size. So here is 100,000 digits of pi. We're going to input it into the hash function calculator. Here's all 100,000 digits. We're going to calculate the hash, and here's the hash function, D7 blah blah blah. And if we scroll down and we just change one singular number, so instead of 41, let's just put 42. What do you think is going to be the hash function? Do you think it's just gonna update and be you know, ending in 402 instead of 401? Well, if we, if we calculate it, it's actually completely different. 41 started with D50, ended in 68, and if we change it to 42, it's now C9 ending in 24. So hash functions get any arbitrary data that's any size, you can input it into a function and it will give you a set character size string. So it's deterministic, so if you put the same data string in, you're gonna get the same string out, but you cannot get the string and try to reverse engineer it and try to get your arbitrary data back. And even if you change that arbitrary data by just a little bit, it completely changes the string. So that's what a hash is. And so we are going to make a Merkle tree with these hashes. So Merkle trees get the leaves, they generate hashes on top. And so we are going to generate hashes for A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. So these hashes are from arbitrary transaction data. And remember that these hashes are completely unique. We have the leaves at the bottom, we get the hashes from A and B, and we combine them. So we have our hash calculator here. We have the data, which is just gonna be A, but imagine transaction A can be like Diego has five Bitcoins. We're going to get A, 
convert the hash, and this is the hash, CA97. Then we're gonna open up another tab and create the hash for B. So B starts with three E. When you combine the hashes of A and B, so we're gonna get hashes A, and we're gonna get hash B, add the strings together, and then we're gonna generate the hash for that. So this hash is the new hash for A and B, and we're going to repeat this process for the pairs. So we're gonna hash C and D together into a new hash, E and F and G and H. And then we're gonna do this again with the pairs, combining A, B hash with C, D. So this is A, B, C, D's hash, combining E, F and G, H into E, F, G, H hash. And then we're gonna hash A, B, C, D and E, F, G, H's hash into the hash at the top, which is called a root. So you can see they're called Merkle trees because here are the leaves, they get combined into branches and the branches combine into a single root. Now, technically trees actually look like this, but you know, they're backwards. The way Merkle trees are verifiable is through these hashes. Let's start at the beginning and just modify one of these hashes. So let's say someone wanted to trick you and so they modified transaction A. Instead of having the transaction data of A, let's say they put the transaction data of K. It generates this new hash. This hash then has to be combined with hash B. So we're going to combine the fake hash A, so this is actually of K, and we're gonna combine B. Notice how hashes A, B combined is 225. Meanwhile, our fake A and our real hash B is 78. So even if we change the transaction data of hash A to let's say P, it modifies this hash, which then modifies this one, which then will modify this one, and then we'll modify the root hash. And realize that these hashes are also strung together. So whenever you generate a new hash, it actually has the old hash in there. So even if you modify just one tiny transaction in this Merkle tree, it has a cascading effect that all the other hashes will also modify as well. And so this is why blockchains use Merkle trees, is for this verifiability. Now there are some downsides, mainly being that it's slow, but these Merkle trees are used for bridging, like IBC, which uses Merkle proofs to prove inclusion of transactions. Let's say we have blockchain B right here. Because Merkle trees and Merkle proofs are battle-tested technology, they're actually used in bridging protocols like IBC. So that was the first whiteboard session around Merkle trees and proofs. Thank you so much for watching.